Hi, the, welcome to uh, Face the Book TV. This is Charlotte Pierce, the producer, and I'm here with Megan Harris, my guest book editor, and we'll get to her uh, presentation in questions uh, in just a little bit, but we are on episode 22. We had a little bit of a break in between, but we started in 2008 at the uh, Arlington Community Media Station, and we now do stream, stream, live streaming on Face or on the StreamYard, and we pull the audio for uh, distribution. Um, so you can find it on all of your favorite audio podcast apps. Just give me a couple of minutes after the, we're finished to uh, distribute it. And we, the Facebook TV focuses on the publishing process, so not writing, but the process of the publishing, getting your book to um, readers. Uh, we give voice to the diverse and growing community of independent publishers and authors, as well as booksellers, readers, industry vendors, and editors like Megan Harris. We poke inside bookshops, printing plants, libraries, book clubs, and all sorts of places where people are writing, designing, producing, selling, or reading books. While honoring print traditions, Face the Book TV also dives headlong into the swirl of new formats that have emerged in the age of social media. Like uh, Megan, uh, I found Megan on TikTok. So that's that's like totally foreign to me, but I'm, I'm getting into it. Um, audio, interactive publishing, and <clears throat> eBooks. So our aim is to help our audience discover exciting new independently published books and learn how to publish their own. We invite you to subscribe on our YouTube channel and use our self-booking form to apply as a panelist or audience member or to learn the craft of media production as a member of our crew. And you can find all the links at piercepress.com and in the show notes on this episode, as well as contacts for um, Megan and other uh, resources that she's going to refer to us. So hi, Megan. So Hi, Charlotte. It's nice to see you. Likewise. Yeah. I was like, I was told that TikTok is supposed to, like, I'm supposed to be on it to like, know how, you know, like people are selling books there. And I found you um, <laughs> because I was searching for book editing books, you know, book marketing, that kind of stuff. And uh, you seem to have mastered that. Oh, well, thank you. I only started in May, actually, of 2021. And oh. um, I started uh, by lingering a little bit, just like watching what other people are doing. And then I was like, well, I'm going to I'm gonna roll out some of my own videos and see what happens. And um, here we are with like 3000 plus followers and growing every day and lots of questions. And it's yeah. just been really fun. <laughs> That's awesome. And do, do you go on other formats too, like t uh, Twitter and um, Instagram? Yeah, um, I do have a Twitter account. I've had that for longer than TikTok. And that's kind of how I found out about TikTok. And mm -hmm. I knew other people who were on it and liked it. Yeah. So I was like, well, I'll check yeah. it out and go from there. Um, I've well, I, I liked what you, you know, I just, I, 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 there's so much like fluff there. Or, you know, like, yeah, I, I, there's only so many things you can watch about, you know, combing your cat or something. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> why I had, You had actual, so you know, <laughs> short, but really useful tips. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I liked what you, you, I have this on the screen now, if, if you're uh, watching the live stream. Um, I love what I do and my clients reap the benefits of my passion to make their own work, make their work better than when we started. So is that kind of what drives you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's exactly what drives me is I've always loved reading and I've always loved writing. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of start with, started with the editing in, in newspaper back in the day mm -hmm. as, um, as a, editor in my high school newspaper and always had a passion for writing and write and reading, you know, fiction is a huge fa passion of mine. And so um, when I graduated from college and was looking for jobs, um, it was like 2011 or so, like the market was still kind of tough. And so I found a small press and I was an editor for them. I, I helped co-edit some books and broke out as an independent editor from there. And yeah. I really, I really love people, uh, love helping people with that. So do you get a lot of fresh clients from your marketing or do you, is it mostly like a, re a word of mouth thing now? Mm -hmm. Well, before TikTok, most of my clients came from doing searches online. So they would find my site from Google. I and see. Yeah. Maybe they were looking at how to, um, the biggest blog post I have is related to onomatopoeia and writing sounds in fiction. And so almost every person I um, who messages me is, I found you through Google. 
I found you from searching this thing. I found you from learning about line editing versus developmental editing. Yeah. And then lately in the last six, seven months, people have said, I found you from TikTok. Will you work with me on my book? And so some of those folks have come to me and um, there's at least one that I know of that's published uh, since we worked together. So it's been really fun. Oh, that's so, exciting. Um, it's yeah, like, that's expanded. it's like having a little baby, you know, <laughs> <laughs> your, when yeah, your book gets published. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention our um, our sponsor, Good Inklings, goodinklings.com. She does Pierce Press, a bunch of other sites for me, and is a fabulous WordPress editor. Thank you, Laura. You're the best. Um, so these are some of the books that are coming up on screen that you've edited. Mm -hmm. As I looked at these, I kind of thought, do you focus on a particular genre? They look mm -hmm. kind of like fantasy or whodunits or something. Um, yeah, there's uh, a little bit of everything. So some authors I've worked with um, have been in the sweet romance space. Um, that's kind of how you see Melissa Storm's book. She's written lots of sweet romance books and has a uh, sweet promise. Sweet Christ. romance. <laughs> yeah, those are those are fun. It's it's kind of like a, a fun offshoot of your typical romance books. Um, I've worked. And then there's sweet mystery too, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so I've also worked in. Um, Cozy Mysteries. So Ian Kaplan is one person who does Cozy Mysteries. Those are like a lot of fun, kind of like your traditional whodunit books. Yeah. Um, I work a lot in fantasy as well. So you can see the, the Rick Waltier and Ari Carr book that's up there is a, a series of theirs in fantasy. And they both separately write uh, their own series um, related to fantasy. Um, lots of stuff with you know, vampires and Bigfoot and like all the different things you kind of see within fantasy. It's a lot of fun. Um, I've written, I've helped people with uh, historical romance books as well. So one of my clients is actually local to me and I've helped her with three of her books. And some of those were the books that were on the screens as right. well. So lots of, lots of variety there. So would you do a book like um, a nonfiction book on change management or like some, <laughs> you know, uh, a scholarly work or would you stick with fiction? I mostly stick with with fiction. I uh, if I get inquiries like that, I'll usually refer it out to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, my professional background is related to some of those areas, but I feel a lot stronger in fiction just because I already have that that foundation. And there are a lot of other people out there that are more skilled in nonfiction. Right. Well, that makes sense, you know. And then you don't drive yourself crazy trying to learn a new. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's nice to stick with what you know because people depend on that in a lot of ways. If they are hiring an editor, yeah. it's, it's good to think of somebody who has that experience. And, that and if they found you, would you be able to refer them to someone that mm -hmm. does a you know good job editing nonfiction? Yeah, I, I'm hopeful that I would. Um, most of the time, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll refer to people in other professional organizations yeah. I'm in. Yeah. So I'm in the AIPP, which is the Association for Independent Publishing Professionals. And um, we have a Facebook group, and sometimes I'll be like, hey, like I have this referral. I don't have the time or it's not my area. Can somebody take this? And then I might pass their name on to someone. And uh, we have a, a little site up here. If you're uh, not, if you're listening, we will go through um, verbally as well, but types of editing, developmental content, line and copy editing and proofreading. Um, are those something that uh, an author should ask one editor to do all those things? Or in what cases would you, say you'd need somebody different or an additional layer of editing? Yeah, that's a really great question. I would say that in general, I've worked with people on developmental editing and content editing in their same project, as well as line editing. But when it comes to proofreading for that final polish, it might be great to have somebody else kind of do that for you. So if I'm working with a client and it's just them and they say, you know, I really appreciate what you've done. Can you do the proofreading too? I might say, you know what? Let's find somebody who can get a fresh set of eyes on this because you've looked at it to death. I've looked at it to death. We've probably looked at, you know, 12 different versions of this by the time we've done developmental editing and line editing. And we've looked at the content. We've kind of made all these tweaks. So a proofreader is kind of good to bring in as a final polish if you're able to afford it and if you're able to find somebody that can right. do it for you. There's lots of self-editing people do as well. But, you know, yeah, that's what I yeah. I mean, self-editing is fine. I would never trust myself to do the final thing, though. I mean, <laughs> I have seen so many things in my own stuff when it's about to go to print. And mm -hmm. there's some horrible, so we, we did have a question. Um, can you tell us some proofreading horror stories? <laughs> <laughs> sure. That's a really we cool. love horror stories. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one frustration I've had with a client in the past is um, they, we, we did all the work, we got it published up there and they had the wrong version. So the version that they published was a version on Amazon that I had never touched and that had been kind of like out there. So keep your files organized and put the very final, very fiery final everybody's looked at it and proofread it and polished it up there. Um, yeah, because, that's a uh, good horror story. I, I've heard of things like, you know, people getting books with blank pages in them and mm -hmm. stuff, you know, always have 
Ingram Spark, if you publish mm -hmm. through them, um, send you a, a sample. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think they may have been just doing it digital, but still like, yeah. either way, you, you got to be as organized as you can at the end there and make sure you got the right file. Because even on the first absolutely. page, I was like, there's a typo in the first sentence. You know, we, we really need to change mm -hmm. that and take it down. <laughs> and can you tell us, like, just go like the briefly what each of these consists of and how mm -hmm. long it might take and sure yeah. yeah so when it comes to developmental editing that can be one uh if you have not done it with somebody before that can take a really long time because you have to have them look through it and give you all of the information about pacing and character development and if there are any areas that are weaker or if there's something within uh your timeline that just like makes doesn't make sense logically so development editing can take quite a while um i usually will go through a client's uh manuscript and add inline comments as well as a one to two page summary about one of you know the different areas of opportunity to fix things so we'll talk about opportunities to improve character development or if there's a specific um way that they can maybe improve the pacing um you know, you don't need every step of every process that someone gets like, you don't have to have where they wake up and they eat breakfast and then they go jog and then they do another thing. And you can cut some of those things out. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of what the developmental edit can flag is to say, like, you know, I'm glad that you've caught this in here, but it doesn't really add to the story. Let's, you know, take this right. out. And so that's what the developmental edits take. Just a quick question in here from someone. Um, do you find that authors are very sensitive about their words? I mean, how much of a psychologist do you have mm -hmm. to be when you're dealing with, <laughs> sure. you know, somebody's like, you know, they're so attached to their words. Oh, absolutely. It's it's really hard to build a thick skin like right out of the, the gate. And so um, as an editor, you kind of have to to walk that line of being sensitive, but also saying like, our focus is to fix your story. Our focus is not an attack on you or anything you've done. The fact that you wrote a book is already an accomplishment and you should really be proud of what you accomplished. Um, that being said, like making those improvements is only going to make the story better yeah. and only going to make it stronger for readers and make it more marketable. Like we, we talked about before we hopped on here. Um, mm -hmm. Marketability is the biggest part of that you need for your book. And if the, the story has problems and you put it out there before it's ready, it's going to be less marketable. It's going to have bad reviews or, you know, less than stellar reviews. And you want those stellar reviews to say this, you know, was a yeah. great book. I couldn't put it down. That's, that's what you want to aim for. Yeah. I don't know if you know the guys from Realm and Sands. That doesn't sound familiar to me. I'm sorry. Yeah, they have a podcast too. And they like they were talking about flow. You know, like mm -hmm. and if you have like one little typo might not interrupt it, but you know, if there's one more, it will stop people and it will completely change their feeling about your book. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, so yeah, and it, it might generate a bad review then, you know, when mm -hmm. the rest of it is fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, so what's the difference between content editing and line or copy editing? Sure. So content editing is kind of a step down from developmental where you can step back and say, OK, we're not getting into every line of the story. We're not getting into every nitty gritty detail. Um, mm -hmm. Is everything like you say, is everything flowing? Is everything going the way it needs to go? Um, are there things within the pacing that we need to kind of chop, you know, chip away at again? Is there um, ongoing themes that we need to address that maybe got you know, dropped off at the at another point? So as an example, I was in um, an editing group recently and someone talked about in a book they were working on and um, someone, it, it was a romance book and the person saved the protagonist from being hit by a train. And then later they kind of just never talked about it again. And so that's a, that's a common romance trope that's out there that people love reading about. Um, but you kind of have to still like have a little bit later on about like, Hey, about that, you know, how about you saving me on the train? Like that, that needs to be addressed and that trauma needs to be addressed in even a small way. So, that's amazing. Um, that's yeah. Do you, do you have little like post-its or something or do you use, do it all electronically? Oh, all the things I'm doing are electronic these days. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I dreamed last night about like printing out a book and editing it by hand. And I know a lot of people who, who enjoy doing that with their own books, but like for me, I'm like, well, then I would have to like put everything back into the into I the know. digital copy. And that's just not how I operate. So. Well, I'm from the generation where, you know, we did the little insert thing and then mm -hmm. the three lines for capitals yep. and, and then the, someone else would go and input it and yeah. yeah, I learned a lot of those symbols. I just don't feel like I've used them a lot since I was in yeah. school, and it's it's nice to think about like that. It's I probably still got it since I'm dreaming yeah. about it, but you know, we should do a it. trivia show and just have like, what does this mean? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Good idea. <laughs> Jeopardy, you know, Jeopardy question. Mm -hmm. Uh, so line and copy editing, and then I mean, like, is that like where 
you know, the character's eyes are blue and you want to make sure they're blue at the end of the story mm -hmm. or? Yeah, that's a little bit of what line editing does, but also you mm -hmm. want to address that in the content. So sometimes um, mm -hmm. if the client doesn't have it yet, I might make them a list of those types of characteristics. So it's good to have either a spreadsheet where you've got name, eye color, hair color, ethnicity, if you are mentioning it, um, other kinds of attributes. So if they have like a scar or something, um, I worked on a book recently where the, the character lost his eye. So you always have to make sure you're talking about the correct, correct eye that's right. uh, missing. Right. And so that's where uh, that kind of comes into play with line editing as well as content uh, editing. So the line editing, you go line by line, you, you fix the the commas, you fix your missing, you know, end quotation mm -hmm. marks. If there's a, you know, a missing parentheses mark, you, you catch that. Um, so it's almost like a step up from proofreading where proofreading is kind of your final polish, but line editing will be a little yeah. bit of all of that. I also try to help out clients with the formatting in that way. So I don't do like full formats, but if someone hasn't um, has tabbed wrong or incorrectly done it or page breaks missing. That's kind of where I step in and say like, Hey, your scene break would be great right here. Or, Hey, your chapters are numbered wrong. Or, Hey, you have an extra chapter 25 or whatever mm -hmm. that comes into play with uh, the line editing just to flag it. Otherwise um, you publish it and you're like, wait a minute, there's two chapters 25. Yeah. So I feel like proofreading, you know, that that's all like, seems like all essential, those three th things, but um, mm -hmm. proofreading is, is something that it, to me, it takes a special brain. Do you mm -hmm. feel like that? Yeah, I think proofreading is something that is uh, definitely a learned skill where you're looking at your style guides, you're keeping it as consistent as possible, uh, you're combing through it as carefully as possible, sometimes doing more than one round. And mm -hmm. uh, it can be really beneficial for someone to do that outside of who's already looked at your project. So yeah. um, if another editor has worked on it and they've read it to death and the client has also read it you know, to the point where they can memorize it and like say it in their sleep, then the proofreader will be someone who can come in and say, have you thought of, you know, this yeah. part or maybe the style guides recommends a capitalization that's not happening. And then that can be, you know, added in. in some right. ways. A little, uh, something I want to address later, if you're comfortable doing it is like mm -hmm. what person should expect to pay for these different aspects mm -hmm. of it. So, you know, I know it all, it depends on the individual project, but uh, before that, I, I think we should get into uh, self-editing and mm -hmm. you had put some points up here on the slides about, about, uh, you know, ways to go about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The first one I had on here um, has a lot to do with the fact that we're in January now. Uh, NaNoWriMo was two months ago and sometimes people will go right from that month of writing a whole book into editing in December. And I recommend taking a bit of a break because um, if you're going to do that, you're really going to burn out on your story and you're going to maybe like lose sight of it or, you know, that, that break is really mm -hmm. essential. So don't write up your draft and say, okay, tomorrow is editing time. You know, like having yeah. that break in there is super important. And that's why I add that in there. Like, you know, get your brain separated from the project for a bit, come back with fresh eyes and that will really help out. And what about automated tools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Word, <laughs> Word and Scrivener, like all these different tools. Oh my God, I saw so many videos about pro writing aid lately, like messing something up. About um, what? Pro writing aid. <laughs> pro writing aid. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a. It's a pretty nifty app. I had it for a while uh -huh. for, uh, for some projects, but um, you have to really keep an eye on what it changes or what it recommends because it's not always accurate. It, it might add in passive voice when you don't want it. It might. Um, I have the wrong spelling for something. Uh, so be careful relying on what the tools in there say, because they may make a sentence that is grammatically correct and just change it to be in, you know, incorrect or not the voice you want. Uh, so keep your, keep your voice in there and avoid relying. That's on very good advice. <laughs> And what do you mean by say it out loud, like read it out loud to yourself? Or? You can read it out loud. There's also different tools that will read your story to you. Um, one of my oh. clients that I mentioned, Rick Walteri, has that um, kind of software set up. And mm -hmm. um, kind of as a follow, final polish, he'll he'll fire that up and have it read to him out loud. And by that time, you should catch anything that's missing. Um, so examples I've seen are like the word through, could be thorough or thought mm -hmm. and you know, things that are very close in spelling. And then you see, you're like, I did not mean that word. Let's fix that. And then you're, you're good to go. It might be kind of a, a, a backup to your proofreading if you're doing some self-editing. or And consider uh, the like version of English that you're dealing with too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's really important too. Yeah. Um, one thing I would say is I, I saw this recently and, and I think people don't always remember this, that um, the way that we spell in American English is not the same as in um, other parts of the world. And so um, if you have characters that are, um, 
you know, from the UK and from the US, um, keep your spelling consistent no matter where you're from. So if you're in the UK and you have American um, characters, don't change color to not have an, a U, like keep everything with the U if you're doing U everywhere. So consistency is helpful and yeah. saying it out loud is a good way to kind of see that because you might be reading along as you're saying it out loud or if the software is reading to you, you can read along and say, oh, wait a minute, like the spelling here should be different or if the software setup's not the right preference, then you can catch it. Yeah, it just kind of keeps, it puts a different part of your brain, like the awareness. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at the same word and someone tells me it's spelled wrong. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm really good at language. I just, <laughs> you just, you know. Um, well, great. Anything else about the types of editing or self-editing that you want before we get into uh, resources? Yeah, I think the last thing I would really say is um, if you're not really confident with self-editing, just do the best you can and keep things consistent. I think consistency mm -hmm. is the biggest part of it because um, if you are going back with an editor and they say, oh, like I've consistently noticed this problem, then it might be easier to do a find and replace and fix what that problem is than to, um, you know, have just kind of glossed it over and, and forgotten about that. So consistency is like the, the thing I stress the most when it comes to, to self-editing. If you can find a way to consistently say it and argue it when you come with an editor later, then um, they might be able to to brilliant to yeah like, that's perfect yeah way very good advice wow um so you have your top five resources we have about eight more minutes so uh, we got a <laughs> bit of time but um so tell me a little bit about each one of these and, and why you <laughs> I recommend them yeah, sure. Um, I recommend them and I, I list these actually on my website as well with um, okay. with my resource list. But each of these is a site that's related to self-publishing and um, provides a lot of topics and tools and resources that help writers. Um, so, for example, with um, janefriedman.com, you will find so many different resources for publishing there. Um, whether you're wanting information about like how do I find a critique, critique partner or um, what you what you need to do for your own self editing, there's just so many different tips and tools that these sites have. Um, and so um, the passive voice, for example, is one that's actually written from the perspective of someone who's involved in law and how this impacts self publishing. So that's where I would I'd go for that. And if you're looking for a community, Ally is the place to go. Alliance for Independent Authors. Um, now that's an English group, right? I think it is in, in the yeah. UK, yeah. But you um, find the value is universal. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. absolutely. I've seen, like, I think I may have found them initially through Twitter and saw a lot of their right. resources and saw, you know, like, this is helpful no matter really where you are. So um, definitely check those out and see um, what kinds of things they offer that might be helpful for you as an author and um, continue to help you on your writing journey. And do you find that a uh, group like uh, IBPA, we my organization is IPNE. Um, it's just an affiliate of IBPA, but uh, and we are we produce in collaboration with independent publishers of New England. I, sh I forgot to say that, but um, do you find like, I mean, the IBPA seems like it has just everything in that. I mean, I think there's editing advice within it, mm -hmm. but um, do you do you have any thoughts about IBPA? Yeah, I think um, groups like that are helpful if you're looking for community and looking for continuing, you know, help within your community. Um, a lot of the writers I work with have worked with like local groups, or they um, are kind of like aware of those local groups and can meet with mm -hmm. them. And then like the bigger organizations, of course, have the more resources. So definitely get involved in um, the groups that you can yeah. um, that are either local to you or in your region. Um, and yeah. uh, see if those would be a good fit for you and for your schedule and for um, what you're looking for to, to get right. out of your writing. Because I think that's the biggest part is like thinking about what your goals are and how, the, how that group can support your goals. Yeah, opposite, great advice. Um, so now it's crystal ball time. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I got this from my following um, Jane, oh no, uh, Joanna Penn. She's a big, you know, like she's investigated a lot of AI stuff, mm -hmm. you know, automated this and that. And uh, not that she thinks that <laughs> automation is the answer to everything, but sure. <laughs> she does go into that sort of edge of the future. Do you have any thoughts about <clears throat> like, are, are we going to get move past print eventually or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people really still like print books. Um, I'm someone that really likes having like a physical copy of books. I went this Christmas and, and bought like a whole bunch of paperbacks of the books that I had edited so that I could have copies of them. 
Um, I think for the the future of book publishing, I've seen a lot about Kindle Bella. I think that's something that people might embrace if they really like um, snackable content. So um, you might get a chapter here and there of those different series. It's just a matter of like, is Amazon going to, will Amazon support that in the future? I'm not really sure. So um, yeah. I'm really interested in what happens with uh, Kindle Bella. I see a lot of people using it for their stories. I think it's hmm. kind of neat to, to explore because um, we remember hearing about um, how Sherlock Holmes was created and how that was kind of your, your snackable content of that time and how people would get those cereals. And it's kind of like a cereal. So I think that yeah. cereals can be really helpful. It kind of helps people think about um, how it works with, with podcasts themselves. Like you get a, an episode every so often and you get a chapter every so often. So I see a lot happening with that. I think people kind of are shying away from how that might look with Amazon, but it really depends on what Amazon does to invest in it. If they decide to continue with it, or if it's something that will be discontinued, yeah. like the Kindle. But world. it's a, it's it's active now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's active now. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people post about it. Um, I, I think even some of the people I follow on TikTok are are posting yeah, so Kindle Bella. Bella, are people concerned about like copyright or releasing stuff mm -hmm. that? you know, that may not, that may eventually go into a book and, and they don't want to put it out there like that? Or? I think that is definitely a concern, but that's a concern everywhere. Um, yeah. I think that's something that, like, I think the people who might be concerned with that aren't necessarily aware that, like, no matter how you release it, it's yours. It's your copyrightable material. And people often do find their books on pirated sites. Even if it's a full book that was never seen by anybody else, then it might be on a pirated site. So it's always really a concern. And I think that's something that um, would be really great if publishing could make that a, like a more stringent process for people, like protect the rights of writers and protect the creators. Right. It's not something that I think gets enough attention. And it'd be great if that was something I saw more in, bu in publishing coming up. Like, how do we continue to pr protect writers? How do we get Amazon to understand that, like, we don't want these books and pirated sites. Can you do something about it? You have all these resources. Yeah. May as well, like, invest into, like, that type of advocacy for writers. You know, I think that's something that a lot of people <laughs> would love to see. Yeah, it's been a big issue ever since the advent of the internet. And mm -hmm. you know, I remember going to Russia early on in the internet, and uh, there were pirated movies and books and everything everywhere. <laughs> not, yeah. not that that's unique to Russia. I don't. Want to. Sure. But um, but anyway, yeah. So let's <clears throat> let's we're gonna have a little time at the end to uh, for anything else you want to add. But uh, my company is Pierce Press, and I. We have a new book coming out, a children's book. I don't produce my own books, but um, this is by my author, Cheryl Davis. And it's a book about um, a kid who flies around the world saving saving uh, habitats and animals and things. Um, do you do Do you do, Maybe we'll have another session about editing children's books, you know, because the text is very short. But I'm wondering what the, the let's do that in the next time you come on. Um, <laughs> it's like we could get into my stuff. <laughs> but um, we'd love to have you connect with Face the Book TV. Um, listen, the episode hashtag is, believe it or not, Face the Book TV. And you can find all the show notes and links and everything to Face the Book TV on piercepress.com. Eventually, I'll have a, a website for Face the Book TV. But we're still going through my uh, publishing site. Uh, the, here's our hashtags, Facebook TV. Um, if you're a mem <clears throat> member of Independent Publishers of New England, we'd love to have you use that hashtag and <clears throat> we will stalk you on the internet and uh, give you prizes and wonderful things. Um, hashtags for, uh, and tags are always helpful. That kind of give, you know, lets us know that you're out there and that you're, and we can uh, collaborate and support each other in getting our books to wonderful readers. Um, we have uh, some upcoming episodes, our fantastic book covers, uh, always a great topic. I love, you know, having artists on and, and having them show their book covers. I think it's, it's just fun. And a book cover is a, it's a critical um, aspect of marketing your book because you, you know, it's, it's the thing that people look at first and, and, you know, a book cover, not that people are judging them by the cover, but maybe they are. I don't know. It attracts them. Um, leveraging book events. So as we get back in post-pandemic to book cooperative book exhibits with IPNE, um, that is a thing. You know, if you make a contact at a book event, how do you then translate that into selling more books? Uh, publishing poetry, which is a 
very unique genre. I mean, I guess that's redundant, isn't it? You would probably flag that in a. In a <laughs> Um, anyway, publishing poetry, one of our, our president of IPNE publishes some poetry and um, he's got a good take on that. Um, social media for the rest of us, always a great thing. Maybe Megan can come on and tell us how to use TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and we'll show you, you know, some of the things you produce. I mean, there, it takes like 30 seconds to view it, but it's, it's like, it's so effective. Um, and converting to ebooks and more wonderful things. Uh, another uh, member of our organization is uh, Mary Catherine Jones. She's the, the um, head of voiceover Vermont, um, he helped us with our, our um, conference. Or she actually ran our conference in November. She was a genius about that. So thank you, Mary Catherine, once again for that, voiceoververmont.com. And we are a production of Pierce Press and now I'm going to give Megan a chance to give the give the last word, you know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, um, thank you for having me. And um, anybody who's really looking for, for editing tips and advice, um, definitely check out the resources that we've got in the slides. I think that would be really helpful to look at. And um, if you want to find me on social media, you can just find me at M. Harris Editor. And that's um, also at mharriseditor.com. It's my website. Um, so thank you for having me and, um, you know, best of luck for, for all you writers out there. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's a tough thing to work on your book and edit your book, especially if you bring in an editor for the first time, but it's totally worth it. So. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of guidance shot. out there mm -hmm. that you can have. So thank you so much, Megan. And we'll, uh, we'll have you back on for that children's book discussion. <laughs> I swear <laughs> I need it. Okay. Thank you. This is Charlotte Pierce signing out for face the book.